Hi, everybody. Welcome. My name is Paul Golan. I'm executive director of the Society for Humanistic Judaism. And this is the sixth in our ongoing series of rabbis and cantors from the humanistic Judaism movement that we called Life, the Universe, and Humanistic Judaism, a lot like myself. And this is exclusive for members and donors to the Society for Humanistic Judaism. If you're a member of one of our local affiliated communities, you're also a member of the Society for Humanistic Judaism. And if it's one of the ways that we uh, thank you for your support, for empowering us to be able to do the work that we do, for helping us bring meaning to folks who are secular and humanistic and Jewish. So we are very excited to bring to you today Rabbi Adam Shalom, who has served as the rabbi of Kol Hadash Humanistic Congregation in Deerfield, Illinois, since 2004. Rabbi Shalom earned a BA in Judaic Studies from Yale University, a master's degree in Hebrew and Jewish Cultural Studies at the University of Michigan, go blue. His rabbinic ordination from the International Institute for Secular Humanistic Judaism and his PhD at the University of Michigan. Go blue again. Rabbi Shalom is Dean for the North American Chapter of the International Institute for Secular Humanistic Judaism, the leadership and rabbinic training institution, institution of the worldwide movement of secular humanistic Judaism. He also serves on the executive committee of the Association of Humanistic Rabbis and is on the editorial board of the quarterly magazine Humanistic Judaism. So I'm going to spotlight Rabbi Shalom, thank you so much for being here. I understand you have a presentation and then we'll be able to do Q&A afterwards. Great, so I'm gonna hand it over to you. Thank you, Paul, and thanks everyone for joining us today. I'm glad to be here to talk about the idea of being Jewish and, and the importance of multiple identities. Now, and has always been a part of my Jewish life because my parents come from very different, both Jewish, but very different Jewish backgrounds. My mother is from the Ashkenazi world, speaking Yiddish. Uh, her family were socialist. Uh, she's a Litvak, if you're into the subtleties of Yiddish identity. Uh, my father's family, on the other hand, were Syrian Sephardic Jews. Uh, he was raised very traditionally uh, and in New York, where she was raised in the Midwest. Now, this program is not focused on subsets of the Jewish community, but I wanted to start with the declaration that it's long past time to discard an old phrase, and it's something you heard about last night if you were part of the SHA's program last night. And that phrase is the concept of looking Jewish. You don't look Jewish, that person looks Jewish. That's really irrelevant. It was irrelevant historically, but it's certainly irrelevant today. And I'll give you a few examples. Now, if you think of someone looking Jewish, you might picture someone like this, who looks like, you know, an Ashkenazi ultra-Orthodox Jew, a older man with a white beard praying at the Western Wall. Well, that's one version of looking Jewish, but this person also looks Jewish. She is a soldier in the Israeli Defense Forces, probably from uh, a North African Jewish community. Um, we have here Ethiopian Jews who live in Israel. Uh, these are also people who look Jewish and certainly live Jewish lives. Now, I tried Googling what a, a Tel Avivnik looks like, uh, you know, a secular Jew living in Tel Aviv. Well, talking in your phone on the uh, in the car probably is close enough. Um, here is an American Orthodox Jew who goes by the pen name Manishtana, which, as you know from Passover, means what's different. Well, he looks and is acting very Jewishly uh, in his professional life and even visually here. And here's a campaign poster from a recent Israeli election I, I challenge you to guess which of the three people on this poster is not a Russian Jew, or you can certainly identify the two that are Russian Jews. The point is that looking Jewish was never really that simple. If you thought about the wide diversity of Jewish communities across the world in Central Asia, North Africa, the Middle East, and in Europe, um, it's always been more complicated than we think of when we say looking Jewish. But especially today, when you add conversion and adoption and intermarriage and the children of intermarriage, the whole idea of looking Jewish is really passe. And I'll give you one last example. This is a woman who is both a rabbi and a cantor. She is the leader of the largest reform synagogue in New York City. Her name is Angela Bookdahl. But imagine someone in her congregation talking about looking Jewish when this is the rabbi. 
Uh, let's get past that concept of looking Jewish because Jewishness is not simply this conflation of religion, ethnicity that's all into one neat package. It's a complex identity, and that's what we're going to be exploring today. Uh, if we're really exploring being Jewish and something, we have to start with what we mean by being Jewish. And there are many variations on trying to define what it means to be Jewish, but in general, there are four major categories. For some people, being Jewish is a religious identity. It's a set of beliefs. It's a set of ritual practices. Um, it includes uh, set prayers and blessings that are to be recited at certain times. It includes uh, dietary laws that restrict what you eat, not simply the conventional in the religious institution religion, but daily practice religion. And of course, major holidays, life cycle events are defined by these beliefs and ritual practices, prayers and blessings, and so on. So for some people, being Jewish is a religious identity. And even if it can be more than that, or it's not limited to that, for some people, it is a religion. Now, for some people, their sense of being Jewish is a biological ancestry. It is their family tree. It is their ethnic descent or their family um, you know, lineage. Um, and for some, it's a genetic connection. I mean, with all of the 23andMe and you know, genetic testing companies out there, some people come across Jewish heritage via genetics and find it to be a very meaningful connection. So uh, we have to include that as one of the categories for the possibility of being the basis for being Jewish. For many people, being Jewish is their heritage and culture. Um, and so that could be something that you grow up with, you inherit, literally, um, or it could be something that you adopt over time. After all, people get naturalized into all kinds of other cultures, um, and they can certainly experience them in a variety of ways. So this is broader than just religious beliefs. This includes language, it includes food, art, uh, styles of clothing, music, and culture can include holidays and life cycle, but understood a little bit more flexibly than religion, where there tends to be strict prescriptions on how to do it, a cultural holiday maybe has a little bit more creativity and flexibility to it. And then finally, you can think about Jewishness as a peoplehood. You know, what does it mean to be part of the American people? Well, it's a claim of shared identity. It's not ethnicity. It's, it could be a wide variety of cultures under that umbrella of American people. Uh, but it's really a sense of being part of a group, however you've defined it. That's why a lot of Jews will refer to uh, membership as being a member of the tribe, right? That's simply um, your participation in the group, your self-identification. Um, and when Jews were asked um, how they identify, and this is from the Pew survey of 2013, just because I think the graphic is a little bit easier than the one they did in 2020, um, you'll see that Different people mix and match these in different ways. Uh, it could be a combination in different degrees or different priorities. And being Jewish has never fit into only one of these. It's never been only a religion. After all, Jewishness began as being a Yehudi, part of Judah, a particular territory, over 2,000 years ago. Uh, it's an identity that comes from your birth in the classical understanding of it. And even conversion um, adds a new pedigree to you. You become a son of Abraham or a daughter of Sarah in the conventional phrasing. Uh, but we know that Jewishness is also not simply an ethnic group, not simply a birth identity, because of the visual and cultural diversity we saw examples of earlier, and because historically you join the group via a religious conversion. And Judaism is understood as one of the world's three great monotheistic religions, even though it's not multi-ethnic like being Christian, you can be Ethiopian and Korean and European, you know, Italian or Irish, uh, where being Jewish always has had this combination of an ethno-religious concept to it. Um, plus, we have to be honest, and we know this in humanistic Judaism, many Jews do not believe those beliefs, do not follow those ritual practices that Jewish tradition tells you to do. They don't recite the prayers. They don't say the daily blessings. So for most Jews, being Jewishness is some combination of these ideas. Um, you'll notice that for uh, Jews in America, a large majority of them said it's primarily about ancestry and culture or some kind of mix of religion, ancestry, and culture, uh, especially for Jews of no religion or those who say, I'm not religious, but I'm still Jewish in some way. 83% said that their Jewishness is a function of ancestry or culture, uh, not simply a sense of religion. All right. 
Um, and really for all of us, it's kind of a cholent. It's a stew of these identities. Now, for a minority of Jews, being Jewish is an all-consuming identity. It defines their religious beliefs. It defines their practices. It defines their shared ancestry uh, and their marriage partners. Being Jewish defines their leisure reading, what music they're allowed to listen to, their cultural expressions, what language they speak. Remember, think of all those ultra-Orthodox Jews still speaking Yiddish in upstate New York to avoid the traif, the non-kosher surrounding culture. Well, that's a fully consuming Jewish identity for them. For some people, their Jewishness defines their politics. It limits their exposure to the surrounding culture. So Jewishness is an all-consuming identity for a minority of Jews. But for most of us, to differing degrees, we live in a diverse world of being Jewish and. So here are some examples of categories that could apply to being Jewish and. It could be your gender identity, being Jewish and male or Jewish and non-binary, Jewish and female. That can affect your expression of being Jewish and your uh, connection to both parts of who you are, uh, your sexual orientation, to whom you're attracted and in what ways, uh, your socially accepted race or color, if that's a category that has meaning to you or has meaning in the society in which you circulate. Uh, what age you're in, what generation you're a part of, being Jewish and in the greatest generation versus being Jewish and Gen Z, those make a big difference. Um, what is your primary language that you use to speak? That can affect how you express your Jewishness, uh, how comfortable you are with Hebrew or not, uh, and, uh, and so on. What university did you go to? That's a part of your identity, uh, as Paul Golan demonstrated very clearly in his opening by cheering for his alma mater and mine as well, mm -hmm. although it was graduate school for me. What sports fandom you're a part of can affect this. After all, you think about your... Um, I apologize for the lawn service that's running here if uh, the noise is uh, distracting. I can't control them. Um, what sports fandom you're a part of can affect your uh, Jewish identity and expression as well. Uh, you know, if it's a Saturday morning, do you watch the football game or do you uh, go to synagogue? Well, that's a choice that people will make. Uh, what citizenship you have, what country of residence you're a part of, and your political affiliations will um, often impact your Jewishness and vice versa, uh, as we see both uh, on our side and the other side, however you define yourself. So, you know, my answers to these questions, I define myself as male, cisgender. I'm the same gender I was raised as. Uh, I'm straight, I'm married to a woman with two kids. Um, I'm white in the conventional understanding of that term um, or in the need for sunblock at the beach understanding of that term. I'm definitely white in that respect. Um, I'm in my 40s, actually a little older than 45 now. This is from an earlier version of this. And I'm part of Gen X. I primarily speak English, though I uh, know other languages. I attend Yale University for undergrad and University of Michigan for graduate school. I generally root for De Detroit sports teams, even though I live in Chicago. Uh, that's where I was raised. Um, I'm a citizen of the United States, and I generally vote for the Democratic Party. Now, different people will have different combinations of these things. Of course, your answers will be different from mine. But it's not really controversial to think about being Jewish and these other categories. Because being Jewish by religion and politically conservative or politically progressive, being Jewish by heritage and a New York Yankees fan, um, by interest, being Jewish biologically and a political citizen of Canada, you know, these are different categories. So it doesn't really seem to be a conflict. Now, some people might not like certain combinations. For example, you have arguments between Jewish conservatives and Jewish progressives over who is a bad Jew, who is collaborating with the enemy, you know. Uh, who is on the right side and the wrong side of being Jewish and a political allegiance. Now, most of us understand that there can be many variations on this kind of Jewish and as additions to a base identity, being Jewish plus your sports fandom, plus your political preference, uh, your language and national identity may be a little bit more deeply rooted than your sports fandom, or maybe not, um, your gender identity, your sexual orientation, your race, maybe even more so. But most of us accept that being a queer Jew or being a Jew of color means that you are both of those identities and you can draw creative inspiration from the intersection of those two. So here's an example of a Jewish pride flag. Um, now, some might not like that combination. Uh, we've had cases of uh, conservative Jews who don't like this, lowercase c conservative Jews who don't like this combination of LGBTQ identity with being Jewish. Um, there's also some on the far progressive left that rejected this flag being part of a, a, what was called the Dyke March in Chicago some years ago, 
because they felt it was too nationalist, even though there were other national identity flags with rainbow colors there at that uh, event. Again, some might not accept these combinations, but globally, they're the Jewish minority. Most of us understand that being Jewish and is an entirely comfortable combination within individual people. After all, I identify personally as both a Jew and a humanist. I'm a Jew by culture and my biology, in my case, and by peoplehood, my sense of religious heritage, and I'm a humanist by my personal beliefs and values. And I don't see any contradiction between those two. I actually find a very fruitful interaction with my identities as a Jew and as a humanist. Um, I have in common with non-Jewish humanists how I understand the world, the power and responsibility of people to act in ethical ways, and the need to meet human needs as a starting point for making moral decisions. And I have in common with, with other Jews who share my religious heritage, this long and evolving culture of holidays, life cycle events, uh, philosophy, belief, and debate. Both sides of my Jewish and humanist inform each other, and they connect me to people and ideas beyond myself. We know that many Jews today and more tomorrow have one Jewish parent and one parent of another heritage, which we'll talk about in a little bit. But what if you went one step more? and you wanted to be Jewish and in the same category. Well, ethnicity, maybe that's easier to understand. Can you be two ethnicities? Can you be Jewish ethnically and Jamaican or Chinese or Italian? Well, that doesn't seem to be too controversial these days. Maybe it used to be at one time, but that seems to be less of an issue today. Now, can you be two religions simultaneously? Well, there are lots of Jewish Buddhists out there, but could you be Jewish and secular? Well, there are lots of secular Jews out there over the last 200 years. But can you be Jewish and Christian? Could you be Jewish and Muslim as both your religious identities? Well, that some people find a little bit harder to get their minds around. Can you be part of more than one peoplehood? Could you be Jewish and American or Jewish and part of an indigenous community? Um, again, for some people, that seems possible. For others, they would still want you to pick a primary and a secondary. Who are you really? Right? Now, some would say you can't be both in the same category. You could be ethnically Jewish and philosophically secular. But in the old Yiddish phrase, there's a saying that one tuchus can't dance at two weddings. Or they would say you can't be part of two ethnicities. You can't be part of two religions. For example, you could root for the New York Yankees in baseball and the Chicago Bulls in basketball. But you would not be allowed to root for both the New York Yankees and the New York Mets. That's the same category, and you have to pick one. You can't be both. So we have to understand a couple of uh, approaches. First of all, to claim that you're part of more than one biology or ancestry, it's like a family tree, right? My kids are part of my family tree. They're part of my wife's family tree. It's not controversial to have mixed ancestry. It's these other categories that get more um, uh, conflict. But let's imagine two concepts to consider, to think about Jewish and in a different way. The first is, the idea of beyond the binary. This is part of trans identity discussions. Um, many people think of these identities as an either or. You have to pick one or the other. You know, being half Jewish is like being half pregnant. Either you're either you are or you're not. Um, and when you think about gender identities, uh, you think about sexual orientations. You know, there's not just one or the other, straight or gay. Uh, there are a variety of these. We think of it much more like a spectrum. You know, the Adam Sandler Hanukkah song talks about Jewishness as math, right? You're half Jewish, you're a quarter Jewish. Well, that's part of this degrees of Jewishness concept, even though we might not make it pure biology as that song does in a joking way. You know, think about it as degrees of Jewishness as a spectrum that changes between people and even within one person at different moments in their life. You know, I might feel very Jewish at a service on Yom Kippur. I might feel less Jewish at a barbecue restaurant. You know, uh, there are times where I'm more aware and times that I'm less aware. And my Jewishness has less of an impact or more of an impact on what I'm doing and how I feel. Um, no one of Jewish heritage is ever 100% or 0%. Most of us are going to be somewhere in between that. So that's the first concept to consider is getting beyond the binary when it comes to being Jewish. The second is a concept called religious heritage. If you think about religious heritage as the religious tradition in which you were raised, the culture of your family, um, your memories and your associations and emotional attachments, 
Well, that's not quite the same as a strictly defined religion with fixed beliefs and practices. Now, why do Jews light Hanukkah candles? Many light Hanukkah candles for family tradition. It's a season of light, right? Um, it's also, of course, in the season of another holiday that involves lighting and family time. They may not believe that the oil actually lasted eight days in a miraculous story that was invented many centuries later, even though the traditional menorah structure looks like this, where you've got your four lights on each side with one taller in the middle for the shamas. That's the conventional design following the strict rabbinic laws of how the lights need to be displayed. But there are other menorahs out there that look much more creative, even if they conform to that conventional rule of the shamas being clearly separate from the other uh, eight lights, which are generally on the same level. But you can also find menorahs that look nothing like the conventional menorah and uh, are and uh, you know allow you to light it in your own ways. And you could even light it uh, at different times, not strictly following the calendar. Some light them always during Christmas season, for example, because it's a religious heritage. It's what they've inherited and get to make choices of for themselves. Remember, inheritance means you own it. So that means you make you get to make choices yourself. There are plenty of Christians who are culturally Christian, who have a religious heritage of Christianity, but for them, the holiday is much more about the um, tree and the presence and Santa than it is about the nativity scene and the miraculous birth and the star and the wise men and all that. Uh, many so-called interfaith families aren't really between a church-going Christian and a synagogue regular Jew. They're much more, uh, much better understood as intercultural holidays. When you think about being Jewish and, of course, this does turn to the topic of intermarriage between a Jewish and a partner of another heritage. Um, and our movement, Humanistic Judaism, has served these families and their children for over 50 years, now over 60 years. We've officiated weddings, we've welcomed and educated the children, we've welcomed the families to be full members of our communities, um, and we've affirmed family choices to be primarily Jewish or Jewish and or simply uh, us. We believe it is their human right to marry the person they love. And the reality is they're going to get married no matter what we say. You know, our choice is to reject them or to be sort of reluctantly, well, okay, I guess so, or to celebrate the love and home that they're building uh, and to encourage them to explore the Jewish part of this new constellation of their family in a non-exclusive way. Um, if a person's getting married or a child of intermarriage is told you have to choose between which side of your family you love, or you have to choose between this other heritage and your Judaism, we will lose. So instead, we tell them how wonderful that you love your partner, your parent, your extended family. We're happy to invite you to come and study this part of who you are and what kind of better results are possible with that approach. Now, the Jewish community has been studying this phenomenon of Jews marrying other peoples for quite a long time. And you'll notice how the numbers shifted. Before 1970, the vast majority of Jews who married married someone who was Jewish. But by the 1990s and the 2000s, the majority of people who are Jews marrying were marrying Jews of other heritage. To describe Jewish as not Jewish, I think it's nicer to talk about Jews, uh, uh, Jewish partners of other heritage. Or sometimes people will refer to Jews and those who love them. That's another nice way to put it. Now, if you notice this result, from the 1990s through the 2000s, with the majority of Jews getting married, marrying someone of another heritage, that means today there are more college students with one Jewish parent than with two Jewish parents. And there are twice as many, inter as many intermarried families as in-married families, because the Jewish person marrying the non-Jewish person makes one household, where a Jewish person marrying another Jewish person is one household, but it takes up two of the Jews in your population pool. So you're actually making more intermarried than in married households. We also have noticed over the last 15 or 20 years that by having doors more open, by accepting a, a father as a parent of a Jewish person, as the reform movement did starting in 1983, uh, or our movement accepting either side, by having more rabbis willing to perform intermarriages, we've seen the number of Jews who have just one Jewish parent has gone up in recent generations. Notice in the silent generation, the baby boomers, only 6%, 18% of Jewish adults in those generations who identified themselves as Jewish had only one Jewish parent. Now, why did so few of them accept being Jewish and in that earlier generation? 
Well, three big reasons. One, it was nearly impossible if you uh, your parents were getting married and producing a baby boomer child, it was nearly impossible to find a rabbi who would officiate your wedding or a community who would accept you as a member. Certainly if the father was the one who was intermarrying and the mother was not Jewish, they wouldn't accept the kid as Jewish. Uh, and so between not being able to find a rabbi to celebrate the wedding, having a Jewish community reject the Jewishness of the child and the family for membership, and the fact that men in that generation, those earlier generations, were more likely to be the ones intermarrying so the kids wouldn't be accepted, even by the reform movement in America before 1983, why would the kids identify as Jewish? I mean, they'd have to be really strong in their uh, self-sense of being Jewish. Uh, and the fact that now among millennials, it's even of the number that have one versus Jewish parent who nevertheless still identify as Jewish and are adults, that means we're doing a better job of retaining these uh, potential Jews in the Jewish community. Um, and again, you have another example uh, from the 2013 study um, where uh, more uh, of the younger generations are continuing to identify as Jewish, where the older generations were less likely to. We're also seeing a big difference in how people are choosing to raise their children. Um, so this is from a survey done in 1997 uh, and you'll notice that only 18% of uh, what they call then mixed marriages were raising their kids Jewish. Um, the uh, Jewish and Christian option was about a quarter. About a quarter was no religion. And 33%, a third of them were being only raised Christian. And again, notice that uh, they are only talking about either or, right? There's no, uh, there's an and here for Jewish and Christian. But the assumption is that, uh, first of all, it's only Jews and Christians, not any other religious options there. And uh, secondly, uh, that uh, there was no option for being Jewish and secular. No, no religion means no identity, and Jewishness is defined only as a religious identity here. But in later years, we've seen those numbers change. So here's from the 2013 Pew study. It shows that among those with a non-Jewish spouse in the household, 20% uh, were raising their kids as Jewish by religion, 25% partly Jewish by religion, that may be a little bit of both, and Jewish not by religion or some kind of mix, that's 16%. You add up those numbers, you're over 60% that are being raised with some kind of Jewish identity, and only 37% are being raised as not Jewish, whether it's another religion or just no religious identity at all, where in that earlier study, it was 33 plus 24, 57% being raised either Christian or no religion at all. Now, you can also see an example of how the Jewish community presents the information in the way this same question was presented in the 2020 Jewish survey. Notice the headline, intermarried parents much less likely to be raising their children Jewish, except they're actually more likely in the 2020 study than they were in the 2013 study. Jewish by religion has gone up from 20 to 28%. Jewish but not by religion has gone from 16% to 29%. Partly Jewish by religion is down a bit, but the not Jewish number is also down from 37 to 30. So you are well into the 60s, even up to 70% almost uh, of being uh, of the children of intermarriage being raised some kind of Jewishness. Now it may be Jewish and, but they wanted to highlight the negative instead of the positive, even though the trend is in the direction of more Jewish and. We also have to recall, and I'm getting to sort of the last uh, part of the presentation here, we have to recall that that concept of religious heritage applies to the non-Jewish partners of intermarried Jews. So here's a study that was done by Brandeis in uh, 2019 of alumni of the Birthright Israel program. Uh, on the 20th anniversary of this program starting, they uh, interviewed the participants and they had a whole set of data that came out of the uh, people who went on birthright as Jews and married someone who wasn't Jewish in their own uh, life. So notice the religious identity of the non-Jewish partners of people who went on the birthright trip. 56% of them said they weren't religious. So I sometimes call this marriage between someone who's Jewish and someone who's not religious an interfaithless marriage. It's not really interfaith because they believe things. They Maybe neither of them believe the conventional religious concepts, but certainly the non-Jewish partner does not identify with a particular religious tradition. Um, some of the non-Jewish partners are informally Jewish or partially Jewish or even in the process of converting. So that's a very different dynamic 
than imagining the church going Christian with the synagogue going Jew. Here's another example. How did they observe certain holidays? For Christmas, 71% of these couples did Christmas with both of them celebrating, and another 15% had the non-Jewish partner doing Christmas in some way. Easter, on the other hand, 32% did it together, 18% was just the non-Jewish uh, partner. Notice Christian religious services. 90% neither of the partners went to Christian religious services. Only 5% of the Christian partners of intermarriages were going to religious services. And 6%, they both went to the services, which is also an interesting experience. And imagine what the kids will be uh, choosing coming out of that background. In the end, we have to think about what these services mean to them. Is Christmas a religious celebration? Well, in many cases, they don't think so. Uh, is it a time to do family traditions? Much more likely the case. Again, you see their Christianity, their non-Jewish religion is a cultural identity too. And therefore, it's much easier for them to connect with both if Christmas is a family tradition time and Passover is a family tradition time, that being Jewish and is having a foot in both worlds. You know, the solution is to think of being Jewish as a family identity. You can be connected to more than one family. You don't have to renounce one parent to celebrate with the other parent. Families have long histories. They have traditions, foods, they have in-jokes, they have a sense of family heritage. They may have a family set of beliefs or values, and there may even be a family sense of political allegiance. You know, we're a long way from the era where a Jew would only marry someone from the same shtetl, or uh, only a Litvak and never a Galician, or however you want to parse these subdivisions of Jews. But there are a number of implications of this Jewish and approach that will change Jewish life, already have, and will be changing going forward. The first is that the, this concept I just mentioned of Jewishness as a family identity. It makes a lot more sense than thinking about it primarily as a religion or primarily as an ethnicity. A family is both more open and more realistic. We also see more of an emphasis on doing Jewish instead of being Jewish. That is, it doesn't matter what percent of Jewishness you feel to spin a dreidel, to light a menorah, to eat a latke or a hamantash. These are all experiences people can have, and the non-Jewish partners of a Jewish and household or a Jewish and family can easily do those things too if we lower barriers to participation. We've seen shifting dynamics on key Jewish issues because of the Jewish and experience. Someone who identifies as Jewish and part of another people may have a more universal perspective than a parochial one on questions of whether they will marry someone of a different religious heritage, their response to anti-Semitism, their approach to Israel, or how or whether they focus primarily on Holocaust memory. Um, certainly, Jewish pluralism will become more complex, not just a question of what do you eat or not eat, and what do you say or not say when you're praying, but whom do you accept as Jewish or not? Because those barriers are getting larger, and those gulfs are getting wider, uh, and that will make uh, Jewish communal efforts and Jewish sort of peoplehood more broadly considered harder when members of your community are not recognized as Jewish by members of other communities. We we'll certainly change how we approach Jewish education. If you're talking about intermarriage, how do you do that? But even more importantly, what do you cover in your studies? And how open are you to other practices being part of your community life versus part of the family life of members of your community separately from what the community does? But there's also new opportunities for cultural creativity. Remember, I started by saying that my Jewish andness of humanism and Jewishness reinforce and creatively respond to each other. And the same can be true for being part of Jewish and another culture. There are plenty of families who fit in a category that uh, Paul Golan knows well of being Jupanese, where they have a Jewish partner and a uh, Japanese partner. And so they have wasabi for their Passover maror instead of the conventional horseradish. Although actually, uh, the secret is that most wasabi in America is horseradish, as it is. It's just colored green and uh, presented a little bit differently. Uh, but this is, again, a way to bring elements of both cultures together, or some families will have a, uh, a painted Easter egg as their egg on the Seder plate. And that's a way of bringing it together. Think of it like fusion cuisine, right? Fusion cuisine can be wonderful, where you bring elements of multiple cultures together, and it's not an either or, it's an and plus. So I want to end with describing four people who could be considered Jewish and. Um, they may be a challenge to the conventional Jewish community, and some might disown or disavow them. Some would make them jump through hoops or jump into a mikvah 
to be fully Jewish, and we would welcome them as already part of our family. So here are four sort of case studies. The first is Rachel. Rachel was born in China to Chinese parents, but she was adopted by Israeli Jewish parents at age three. She never formally converted to Judaism, but she's fluent in Hebrew. She celebrated a bat mitzvah, and she was married under a chuppah. Is Rachel Jewish or Jewish and? Second case, is Jacob. Jacob was born to a Jewish mother and was given up for adoption. He uh, was adopted by a household where the adoptive father is Mexican-American. The adoptive mother is originally from India. The household was secular, so they really didn't practice any religion. Around age 25, Jacob discovers that he has Jewish heritage. And he says, eh, okay, I'm Jewish, no big deal. Doesn't really change his life. A third case, Sarah. Sarah was born to two Jewish parents. She was raised in a Jewish community. She celebrated a bat mitzvah. She decided in college that she's a total atheist. She wants nothing to do with organized religion, with nationalism, with any kind of separate ethnic identity. She wants to be just a human being. When she's asked on surveys about her religion, she says none. And then she's asked, well, do you consider yourself Jewish in some other way? And she says, no. Or maybe she says yes, depending on the day or where she is in her personal journey. And finally, we have Sean. Sean was born to a Jewish father and an Irish Catholic mother. Sean celebrates home holidays of Christmas and Hanukkah and Easter and Passover culturally, but they never attend religious institutions, has no formal education of being Jewish or Jewish culture or community, and never had a bar mitzvah or any other kind of formal Jewish ceremony. In college, Sean decided to take a birthright Israel trip and is told that he had to be Jewish or something else and can't be both. And his response is, but I am Jewish and. From our perspective, all these people can be Jewish and. Only you could answer in your eyes if you consider them primarily Jewish or Jewish enough, or if you don't even care about that category. But on your answer and on our answers, a vibrant Jewish future depends. And so with that, um, I'd love to open up for comments or questions. I've seen some items in the chat. I can't read the chat and talk at the same time, uh, but I'm happy to look back through that if there were questions there. Uh, otherwise, uh, you know, I'm happy to uh, have people recognize. I'll let uh, Paul and his staff handle choosing who gets to ask a question. I see Herb's hand up first, so I'll actually remove my spotlight and yours and let Herb ask his question. But I have two questions for you, unless one of them is asked by Herb, but we'll see. Go ahead, Herb. I doubt it. I'm a secular Jew, and I also consider myself an Adolf Hitler Jew in that Adolf Hitler would have considered me a Jew, and I don't want to give him a posthumous victory by denying that I'm a Jew. And I have family who died in the Holocaust, and my parents, when I was raised, told me, never trust a, a, somebody who's not Jewish, which I, of course, rejected. I'm married to a shiksa. So uh, that's the other kind of Jew I am. Yep. There's the sort of uh, social fate Jew. Some people will describe it as. And um, the dilemma is, if you want to build a vibrant Jewish identity, I don't think it starts with people want to kill you. Um, <laughs> so that's why I've tried to focus on other aspects uh, that people connect with. Um, but it's true that, you know, it sometimes will come back to that. Uh, what do other people think and how would they treat you? Um, but just like I don't want to give Hitler a posthumous victory by not being Jewish, I don't want to give him a posthumous victory by defining my Jewishness as primarily a biological identity and a social threat. Um, so that's why I've, I've talked more about peoplehood, culture, heritage as uh, positive connections. Mm -hmm. I'll also uh, comment just briefly. Uh, the term shiksa these days is not generally used because it, it relates related to the Hebrew word for shegetz, which is like a creepy crawly insect. Mm -hmm. um, and it also has an implication of promiscuity and loose morals and so on. So just like Goy has a kind of negative connotation of being not smart, um, uh, I would avoid the term shiksa 
person. Well, I, only, I only do it with my wife, she, who gets a kick out of it. I hey, think we, we know that some groups are comfortable with slurs that other groups can't use. I just wanted to highlight it for uh, <laughs> other people. Yeah, it, it's kind of like who gets to say the N word. Right. Uh, but th like I've I've seen folks who own it. Um, I had two questions and that I think are going to be challenging and I didn't prep you beforehand. So I'm sorry if I challenge and you can feel free to demur. But um, the first is since you started off talking about um, Jewish racial diversity, I think um, so even identifying percentages of American Jews by race is a controversial thing. And there's been a lot of debate about it. And I've seen the range from like 10 to 30 percent might be um, non-white. And whatever that percentage is, I don't think we're hitting it in our movement. And I feel like we're doing great uh, engaging interfaith families, which you talked about, and I think we're way ahead of all the other denominations, even in LGBTQ inclusion, although Reconstructionist Judaism does a, does a great job with it too, reform as well, but I feel like we, in both those categories, not just accept, but embrace and empower, and, you know, it's, it's our leadership from the get-go, really. So what is it, do you think, that we can be doing differently to engage more Jews of color? So this is an interesting challenge. Um, I've often wondered if our emphasis on Jewishness as an ethnic identity, which has been part of our rhetoric for quite a long time, um, has held us back in that respect because people assume we mean you have to pick one. And someone who's of multiple heritages doesn't want to pick which identity they are. They're both, you know, like if, I, if they're half Jewish, which half? like inside or outside or left or right, you know, it doesn't make any sense. Um, and so our focus on ethnic heritage paradoxically may have turned some people off to uh, identifying with us. Um, secondly, I think that um, for some people, they are looking for something more conventional if they're um, less automatically accepted. So we had a case of a, a gay couple when I was working in Detroit early in my career in the early 2000s. One of the partners had been raised at a humanistic congregation and they got married. They had a, a, a child they adopted. They joined a more religious church, which was the culture of the other one. And I, I said to Andy, I said, Andy, what are you doing there at this church? You know, why not come to us once in a while? He said, well, my partner really wants something more traditional to feel more how do you say it? Kosher, <laughs> you know, more accepted. And so because we're so non-traditional in our community structure, in most communities, in our approach to Jewish life, in our be mitzvah ceremonies, we love the fact that we're creative and different. But uh, for some people, the idea that um, you are, um, sorry, uh, the idea that you are um, uh, less conventional in some ways, you want a more uh, conventional endorsement behind it. Um, and the the third reason is, um, I don't know, maybe we're suburban and these tend to be urban populations. Um, maybe our due structure is not as uh, welcoming or the whole concept of fixed dues makes it hard to, uh, to sell to people who aren't used to that experience. Um, in some cases, their families were so rejected by the Jewish community, they don't anticipate anybody would welcome them anyways. Um, and so that's a hard sell for all of us. Um, I don't have the magic bullet for this issue, uh, but it is a very important one. And it's uh, as that population is growing, and we know that it is because the younger populations have a higher proportion that are Jews of color or married to people of color. Um, we have to we have to find a way to speak to them um, that in ways that uh, that reach them. Great, right. and I see Merner's hand up, but I do want to ask my second question because. Rabbi Miriam Jarris beat me to it by putting it into the chat. That was going to be my question, and that just shows that we've been working together way too long, I think. But um, she, she read my mind. So she wrote, the Jewish community doesn't typically recognize Messianic Jews as Jews, but many say they are. How do you respond as a humanistic rabbi? I was actually going to phrase it by uh, referring to the definition of who's a Jew that our movement um, accepted in 1988 and i just put the link in the chat if 
people have never read it before. But to me, the key phrase of it is that a Jew is a person of Jewish descent or any person who declares himself or herself or themselves, it should be, to be a Jew and who identifies with the history, ethical value, culture, civilization, community, and faith of the Jewish people. And so there have been debates in our humanistic Jewish discussion group on Facebook around this. And, and I think I know the answer, but I just want to give you the space to, how do you address that? Well, there's a book that came out um, about 10 years ago called Being Both um, that was written by a woman named Susan uh, Katz Miller, who's part of a community in Washington, D.C. that raises kids connected to both religious traditions. Um, they have often one Jewish parent and one Christian parent, uh, or one Jewish parent, one Muslim parent, but the idea is to raise them as identifying with both religious communities. And there are similar schools in Chicago, in New York, in San Francisco, and in a couple other places. Um, so those are people who are being raised actively in both religions, but they're sort of both religions in parallel. The issue of Messianic Jews or Jews for Jesus is the, the syncretism, the combination of the two. And, you know, we don't have an issue with Jewish Buddhists, which are two different religious traditions, sometimes with conflicting religious beliefs. If you actually read the real religious beliefs and not the Americanized version, you know, like Americanized Chinese food versus real Chinese food. Um, and the same is uh, true for other traditions that we don't have a history of conflict with. But Jewish and Muslim, Jewish and Christian, we have very strong, you know, emotional reactions against any kind of combination of the two. On the other hand, believing in a false messiah is not new in Jewish life, right? After all, anyone who's experienced the Chabad world knows that the Lubavitchers had a major split when their previous Rebbe died and some believed he was the messiah. And so there's another modern version of Jewish messianism that's happening uh, simultaneous to our own experience. So if the Lubavitchers are not expelled for believing that Schneerson was the Messiah, then I'm not so willing to kick out the uh, Jews who believe that Jesus may have been the Messiah. There was a comment made that is astute that there's a, sometimes there's a difference between Messianic Jews and Jews for Jesus, where Jews for Jesus was an initiative, I think, by the Baptist Southern Baptist Church to forcibly go out and convert Jews, uh, where Messianic Jews are Jews who identify with Jewish life and culture, but who are convinced that Jesus was some kind of Messiah and are trying to find harmony between the two. Um, you know, look, there are plenty of people who are happy to draw the line with us outside. Um, and so if that's the case, I would rather draw the line that's a little bit more open, where you can hang your hat if you want to in that movement statement is the claim that uh, a Jew is someone who identifies with the future of the Jewish people. If the goal of the Messianic Jew or the Jew for Jesus is for the Jewish people to disappear, well, then that's not in our sense of what counts as uh, a viable Jewishness. Um, but, you know, I, I'm much more flexible. It's easier for us than it is in Israel where there are citizenship and, you know, uh, rights and privileges that come from us. For us, being Jewishness is an elective. You know, it's extracurricular. Um, as I think Moshe Dayan said, uh, whoever is crazy enough to want to be Jewish deserves it. Like, you know, let them in. Um, and I did want to also respond to one comment that was in the chat uh, by Rachel about the woman who was born and raised Jewish, but then chose to sign out. Um, I support what Rachel said, that if someone chooses to not be Jewish, I let them not be Jewish. I am not Hitler who's going to chase them down and force them to be Jewish because of their heritage. I prefer self-identification. If we allow people in easily, we have to allow them to leave. Otherwise, our Jewishness is like the Hotel California, where you can check out any time you like, but you can never leave. Well, I would rather let people leave if they want to and let people in who want to come in. Thank you. Myrna, you got to unmute. I'm sorry, Myrna, can you unmute? I'm trying. Oh. OK. Um, so I missed the first few minutes and joined late. I've really enjoyed listening to this. I wanted to comment on um, multiracial families. Um, I have one and my grandchildren are black. My wonderful son-in-law is, They've, they're of Caribbean descent. And my daughter grew up in humanistic Judaism and we're working to have a, they have a multi-religious home and there are tons of book, secular Jewish books where we can find them or our own writing and lots of storytelling. And 
I think, I mean, this is just from our limited experience because we're working at this. But her generation, you know, this generation of millennials, there are a lot more multiracial families. And wherever they exist in our movement, we need to bring them in, not just as a lone family on the outside doing their own thing, but try to integrate them into our communities. And that's how we're going to bring in other families. Because even in this congregation, which is in, you know, an urban center where there are probably a lot more families, they, they try to be inclusive in the language, but they just don't hit it right. I've pointed it out. I'm not heard. So because unless you live it, you sometimes don't recognize the language. So we need to bring in people, young people who live this and know how to talk to other people who also live it. And I think that's the future if we want to be fully inclusive. Thanks, Myrna. And I'll add, sometimes the rhetoric we use is important. So if you talk about you know uh, relationships between Jews and Blacks, that's assuming that you're one or the other, but you can't be both. <laughs> Right. right. I mean, we have a multiracial family and that's right. They're not, they're not picking one or the other. They're both. Right. Um, right. And or, now we all are. <laughs> right. So th this is one of those, um, you know, questions of rhetoric, questions of what images are on your website, you know, uh, what kind of families are depicted there. That's very important uh, because people are going to want to go places where they feel welcome and included. Um, and they aren't going to want to go places where they feel um, either intentionally or unintentionally excluded by the way things are presented. Now, the balancing act to that is that um, we draw all kinds of people from all kinds of backgrounds, including white-white partnership, right? Um, and including even Jewish-Jewish marriages. I'm a minority in our movement because my wife is Jewish and I'm Jewish. And we have, you know, uh, we have um, uh, a non-Jewish step-parent. So our kids have, I think, one Jewish, uh, one not-Jewish grandparent and the rest are all Jewish. Uh, that's unusual in our movement uh, because of that we've you know uh, uh, been so welcoming to intermarried families and you know families with two Jewish parents may have a synagogue they're already members of and so they wind up going there instead of uh, finding us. But um, our movement's messaging has to appeal to everybody, um, and that will include Jewish Jewish partners. Uh, and so for those people, that language of ethnicity is still important to them. That is how they self-define in their Jewishness. That sense of heritage is important to them, even though some people who, let's say, become Jewish or you know, convert, adopt, whatever the, the phrasing is, they don't have an heirloom menorah that they've had in their family for generations. So they're not going to have that, that hook for them. We have to be very creative in finding ways that appeal to a wide range of ways people connect in non-exclusive ways. Um, and so the sensitivity of hearing it from other people's ears is really important. Um, but also accepting that, you know, sometimes the conventional is also who we include. Um, so defining ourselves as anti-traditional. Well, some people like the concept of tradition. Some people have family members who are still Orthodox and don't want to treat them all as hypocritical bumpkins. You know, we have to find the right balancing act of our integrity and honesty and saying what we believe, but also accepting we have a, a, a even more diverse audience to draw from than we did before. I think we have time for one more question. If somebody has one who wants to chime in, there have been a couple of things mentioned in, in the chat. If you want to just unmute and, and say them, if you're comfortable. Well, I saw Andrea had a, a comment I wanted to respond to. I'll do it briefly. Um, the question is, why judge other people's Judaism? Is it coming out of fear? Is it tribalism? Um, I, I think that's part of it. I think part of it is also an uncertainty about your own Judaism. You know, you can make yourself feel better by pointing at those people who are doing it wrong um, or by keeping someone out. You feel more in. You're the gatekeeper, right? You're the guardian. Um, so sometimes we've excluded Jews to make the ones that are in the group feel more in the group. Um, and that's a tragedy. Um, so we, we try not to do that. And that's why we're more inclusive in our definitions of being Jewish than just about anybody out there, in part because we've been judged out too many times in the past. You know, it's that step beyond the golden rule, don't do to others what you didn't like, you know, do even better. And so that's what we try to do. Anyone else want to ask a question? 
do we need a critical mass in order to make people feel welcome? Well, this is the chicken and egg dilemma, right? Um, if you have one or two multiracial Jewish families, um, are they the tokens? <laughs> are there pictures on everything? Uh, and then it becomes uh, obviously cliche that you're doing that. Um, do you use stock photography of people that aren't in your community or not? Or does that feel inauthentic? Um, you know, uh, getting past that sort of the hump uh, is, is tricky to do. Um, part of it is by programming. You know, uh, we in our community, uh, thinking of LGBTQ outreach in a different category, um, we, for the last several years, have done a Pride Shabbat in June on purpose um, so that people can see examples of past programs. We get pictures of events. We also walk in a suburban pride parade and give out things there so people there see us. But it's a process, you know, to develop that library of past events, to have a library of pictures of those kind of programs uh, to, to show that you're walking the walk. Um, and so it may be that uh, a series of programs on uh, interracial Jewish experience or multi-ethnic Jewish communities is what's needed to sort of gain credibility. And the nice part is if you record everything and put it on YouTube, people can find it. Uh, or it gives you a, a thing to point people to if they have concerns about it. It may also be if you're a more politically active community that taking stands or walking in marches on particular issues is a way of, uh, you know, uh, raising your credibility on that front. Um, but I think you're right, Carol, that uh, at some point you need a critical mass. Um, and it's it's tough to get that unless you get a group of like eight families <laughs> find you and uh, and join you at once. Um, it's going to be tricky to uh, to hit that. Um, yeah, but but if there's two two families in a, in a group of others, they can support each other. They can be there for each other. And I think also leadership is important. If you have these marginal people who feel, you know, are in leadership, they're seen. Well, here's another way to do it. Bring in guest speakers. There are lots of Jewish uh, people of color organizations and leaders and rabbis now um, who can come in and talk to you about their experiences, uh, offer their insights, help guide you in what your community is doing. Um, and having their face on things, even if the leadership of your community tends to look white, um, you can find ways to uh, diversify your program offerings by bringing in other people and, uh, you know, and, and, and paying them an appropriate honorarium, which is fair. Um, that's another way to show that you're <clears throat> valuing uh, Jewish inclusion in all of its respects. I well, think Israelis you. have sometimes also felt that they were on the periphery and not accepted in the commu a Jewish community. Yeah, I mean, there, there's all kinds of inclusion we could do better on. Absolutely. So I really appreciate all of your presentation today. And I think that that is the key point that you're ending on is recognizing that we can do better on inclusion. So I really appreciate all of it. And thank you for being here. And thank you everyone for attending. This is always the second Thursdays of the month. So we have two more. We'll probably take a break for summer. And then I have to ask all the rabbis again next year if they're willing to do it, but I hope they will be. Because as you can see, if you've been joining us throughout, there's a remarkable diversity just of topics and conversations and the ways that our humanism and our Judaism touch all aspects of our lives. So thank you again, Adam, and thank you everybody for being here and see you again soon.